Because we share. Because we share. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Bitbucket. We all made it to the end, and this is uh, the payoff for a long week of share. So this is our this is our X32 Bitbucket, and these are our odds and ends short subjects that couldn't fit into a full presentation and we have a number of different speakers today I'm going first then Ed Jaffe, Marianne Matias, Sam Newton, and Skip Robinson so we like to try to come up with funny titles and with apologies to Cole Porter I'm gonna talk about undo that voodoo that you undo so well so this <laughs> this question came to me uh, a little while back and some guy says can't you undo past the save you know I saved the data but I screwed it up and I want to undo past that I want to go back and I said I didn't think you could do it um, but uh, if you ever saw the happy days where Fonzie tries to say that he was he can't say the word wrong so he says he's not exactly right so in this case I was not exactly right Set undo keep is a command that's been around since ZOS v1R9. So what it does is it keeps the undo buffers even after a save. So you can go back to before the save. But to enable it, it's not quite that easy because when I first tried to do set undo and specify keep, it said set undo unavailable. So what you have to do is you have to run ISP CCONF, the ISPF config utility, and you have to enable set undo keep. And the way you do that is in the editor settings, you're going to set the undo storage size to a non-zero number. And then you check set undo. And I like to check the force set undo so that when they go in, they will get set undo by default. So basically right here is the undo storage size in the ISPF configuration dialog. And here we have it set to 1024. That's in K blocks, so basically that gives you a mega storage. That's usually plenty to do undo in this case. So then we go further down and we have the set undo on, and we are going to force that setting so that the user gets set undo without having to do anything else. They will have to do one other thing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so we go into an empty data set and I just did this to show you how this would look when we go in by default we have set undo STG STG is the default for set undo when you turn set undo on unfortunately set undo keep is not a configurable option that's an RFE I'll be submitting <laughs> so uh, you'll see that coming from me later but so what you have to do here is you actually have to type in set undo keep and then that'll save it in the profile for that particular member. So then now I did the set undo keep. Now I have over here set undo keep in my profile. So now I, I went in and I just typed in this is the first undo, the second undo, the third undo. And then I said I typed in a fourth line and said this is the save. So I'm going to do my save on the fourth line. And up here, I have member share 125 saved. OK, now it's saved. Normally, if I tried to do undo at this point, I would get the undo not available or no more to undo. I forget the exact message. But basically, it would tell me that there's nothing I can do here. But I type in undo, and I go back one level. So now I've gone, I've undone past my save point. I thought that was pretty cool. So now I'm at the third undo, and I, I do undo again just to show you that I didn't fake it. And now, now I'm at the second undo. Now, people, people asked me earlier this week, do you have a redo function? Not yet. That'll be another RFE. <laughs> so we are working on that one. Okay. So with apologies to Bob Dylan, I'm going to call this my back page data sets. This question keeps coming up on IBM main over and over. Is it OK if my page data sets are over 30% full? No, no, no. A thousand times no. 
a lot of people seem to think that this is an old rule of thumb and that there's a new rule of thumb that says you can go past 30 and it's not going to hurt you from a performance standpoint, but nothing could be further from the truth. Basically, above 30%, there's a block paging algorithm that the auxiliary storage manager uses to manage page data sets. And if you go above that 30%, this block paging algorithm is really inhibited in how efficiently it can manage the paging space. So you want to keep your page data sets below 30% full. And please don't propagate this myth that it's okay to run above 30%. I actually have gone into shops where I've seen 35, 40% and the sysprog thinks that that's A-OK. -okay. And I double check this with the guru. So if you don't want to believe me, you please believe my uh, good friend, the gentle lady from the state of Florida, Cheryl Watson. Cheryl uh, basically looked this over and she basically signed off on everything that I'm saying here. So I couldn't think of a better authority to go to. So since you're going to do this, if you do have a page data set that's over 30%, you want to fix that. And one of the, the other things that came out of this question on IBM Maine was that people either weren't allocating enough page space or they were allocating page data sets of different sizes. And that can tend to cause problems. One of the things that I recommend is that you allocate 2 to 3x your real memory on the LPAR. So for example, now we have like 16 gig, 32 gig, you know, 64 gig. If you got a 32 gig reel, you should be looking, and this is just a bare minimum, you should have a 64 to 96 gig of page space available. And that's only if you're not taking dumps. If, you're, if you have to take dumps, then you might need even more. So don't undersize your paging environment especially when you're adding real memory, you want to increase it so that, you know, again, two to three X your real memory is kind of a bare minimum of what you want to run. Another one is you want to allocate all of your page data sets to be the same size because ASM does not care how big they are. He fills them equally. So if you have smaller page data sets, you can run into that 30% threshold earlier, even though you might have larger data sets that are below that threshold. So allocate them all the same size and you can manage it a lot better. Talking about locals, right? The question is, are you talking about local page data sets? Yes, I am talking about local page data sets. For PLPA and CSA, this is not an issue. PLPA in common, I should say. It's not an issue. It, PLPA, it's not unusual to see that run at 100% or a very high percentage. That's a good question, Gordon. Thank you. Yeah, this is for local page data sets. Basically, you want to prevent those smaller page data sets from hitting that 30% threshold and getting you into trouble. Because once one data set goes into that 30%, the ASM block paging algorithm is inhibited at that point. And ASM, again, doesn't care about the smaller page data set. He's not going to allocate based on the number of slots. So go forth and fix your page data sets. And I will turn it over to Ed Jaffe at this point. All right. So uh, uh, in the uh, MBS Core Technologies project opening, uh, uh, probably a lot of you were there. And you heard John Shebby talk about he tangentially mentioned this new function APAR, uh, APAR OA46291. Okay, and the implementation of that particular APAR caused the high half of R15 to uh, be non zero even after a successful uh, storage obtained with con equals yes. Now, actually, the, it turns out that, that this function is rolled back. There's three different PTS, but it's only the OS 2.1 that's affected, okay? Now, it's actually perfectly legal to do that. The high half of R15 is not part of the documented interface for almost any service in the world. In fact, when they went to 64-bit, they were very careful to say, do not depend on the high half of R15 as part of your return code checking. Um, and lots of people did anyway by mistake. So we ended up with lots of software products that had failures. 
We also ran into this, okay? We had a, a LTGR 1515 after a storage obtained a conditional one. And so because it was non-zero, the product thought that, you know, there wasn't enough storage when in fact there was. And he talked about some situations where the uh, IBM product would keep trying smaller and smaller amounts and get into a loop trying to get storage. So it's a real problem. And we corrected that with this instruction instead, load and test grande forward register, okay? Now the thing is, if it was just us, IBM would have said, you know, you should have read the book, you should have been, you know. But instead, since so many of their products broke, they decided to change it, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's kind of like history being written by the victor kind of thing, you know? So anyway, uh, so it was Mark PE, and so they got a new APAR out of that, OA48273, which is open to clear the high half of R15. I checked, I don't think this thing's closed yet, but you know, it's an easy, easy thing. I guess you can get the plus plus A par from IBM. But th from my perspective, what I wanted to talk about here was the, the A par that, that dri drove all this, because now it's not gonna end up on your system. It'll give you a chance to take a look at it. And that is this new A par that's intended to reduce the number of IPTE instructions that are being issued. So an IPTE, invalidate page table entry, what it does is when you, when you free up a page, um, you know, it's one thing to update your page control blocks, that's that thing, but when you issue IPTE, it's an instruction that goes out and, and uh, essentially clears the TLB, right? And it doesn't just clear it on your processes that you're on, it clears it on all the processes in your book and all in your drawer and across all the drawers. And basically every processor that might have access to this piece of storage has to get a signal to tell it to go ahead and, and free up the TLB, okay? So when you have lots and lots and lots of processors like these new machines can have, it can actually be kind of slow in the grand scheme of things to, to issue an IPTE. So they decided, to try to um, bypass that. That's what this, this APAR does. It's like now when you free main a page, it no longer actually frees the real storage in many cases, okay? It's, it's driven by RSM, SRM decisions, blah, blah, blah. But so you can end up with this situation where, where the real storage is not freed in the traditional sense. And so there's some interesting side effects, okay? You free a page of, you get mained or storage obtained a, a page of storage, then you free main or storage release it, and then you reference it, and you don't die, right? It keeps on going. You're, you don't get the OC4 you used to get. Well, that's a change of behavior, and some people may be surprised by that. You might have dependencies on that in your code, maybe in some ISV code. It's worth knowing. Also, TPROT, okay? A lot of people were using TPROT in the old days to test storage addresses, you know, test protection. And uh, then there were a lot of people in the old, old days that used LRA for this same purpose. And then when 64-bit came out in Z architecture, LRA wouldn't necessarily work because if it was backed above the bar, even though your virtual may have even been 24-bit, LRA is a problem, right? It fails if the storage is backed above the bar. So you either had to change your code to use LRAG or... Um, but a lot of ISVs didn't want to use LRAG because LRAG didn't necessarily work on older machines. So they switched to TPROT. So you see, saw this proliferation of TPROT. Well, now TPROT has new behaviors in that it will no longer generate condition code three for the freed page unless it happens to be out, right? And then um, lastly, uh, configuring storage offline. If you do that and you're in a storage constrained environment, there could be a lot of pages out there that are still in this state and maybe the the configuring of the storage offline may fail. So I just wanted to point that out because I really didn't see it mentioned in too many places, uh, or it didn't, I didn't see it mentioned in any of the places I went, but the, somebody may have mentioned this. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Take a look at this, at this um, uh, thing. There's doc down here. There's a PDF that has all the great doc on it. It's, they wrote like a whole book on this one APAR, okay? So Dan Rosa is the guy behind this. And um, he uh, put a lot of really great info in there. But I will tell you that if you want, you could turn this thing off, right? And by the way, it's on Z13 only. So if you're on Z12 something, then uh, it only does it on Z13, okay? But in Diag XX, you can actually code free mainframes no, and that shuts the whole thing off for that system. You can also leave it as free mainframes yes, which is the default, but then you can ex uh, specify and exclude job list, and those are 
wild carded mask things, right? So you could have up to eight of these and shut it off for a whole you know, class of work if you run into any problems. They also added these new callable services with this APAR. So I, you know, I'm probably not going to see a lot of ISVs using this right away, and, and, but maybe customers will. Anyway, you can pass in an address to be tested, and you get back a return code in register 15. And, and interestingly enough, I mean, all the return codes I ever used, you know, or defined in services I wrote over the years, usually went by force. Probably because in the old days, we used to use jump tables to process them or something. So you had 0, 4, 8, 12. You know, that's what we're used to. Whoever wrote this decided to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, why not? I mean, <laughs> you know, it gives you a bigger return code space anyway. Then again, with 64-bit register, who cares? Oh, no, but we're only allowed to use the low half. <laughs> So, uh, and these are the codes you get back, you, whether you have read, write, or no access to the page, and whether the, it's not backed by a so-called free main frame, and then lastly, the page can't be translated or is backed by a free main frame. So if you get this last one, then you really need to use VSM list or some other service like that to, to figure out what's going on there. Anyway, so I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Um, forewarned is forearmed. Um, this one is about, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, NJE over TCP IP. In the old days, way back in August 2002, I actually helped co-author this requirement right here uh, in the JES3 project um, uh, to ask for uh, TCP IP over native, I'm sorry, NJE over native TCP IP because there were a lot of people who were pushing enterprise extender and things like that, and those were expensive solutions. And so, and then uh, in the next chair, t March 2003, the JES 2 project had a very similar requirement. And so th this right here illustrates part of the value of share, that we put out these requirements, we help uh, guide the direction of IBM development. And um, we were feeling like the weak sisters, in a sense, as MVS, because uh, VM and VSC were already doing this. And they were connecting via TCP IP, even though there wasn't even an official stack on VSC. They still had the support, so it was pretty amazing. Anyway, um, uh, IBM delivered this stuff in 2006 and 2007 across the Jezus. So it's been like nine years, and by now, you know, it's become the de facto connection. Are there people in here that, that are still, you know, pure SNA, and I mean SNA, not Enterprise Extender or somebody like that, that's running NJE over pure SNA? Okay, not one hand. So that's a good thing. Um, so there are people with Enterprise Extender and similar technologies to, like that, but you can see right there, this has really taken hold. So now we get to the, you know, you talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, so right now is the ugly. So there are some uh, security APARs that you need to look at now if you are using this uh, NJE over TCP IP functionality, and IBM brought it to our attention. They talked about it in the JES sessions, but not everybody goes to the JES sessions. And so there's an APAR for JES Common, one for JES 2 and JES 3. There's a new option called uh, NetServe Secure, and you can either uh, say that it's required or optional. And if it's required, then it, you need to have secure connections. You're not allowed, you know, encrypted connections. You're not allowed to have unencrypted connections, okay? So in JES 3, the default is optional for this thing, but, you know, obviously it make, might make sense to set it to required. And also in JES 2, they have a different, an additional option called use socket. And so they will, you know, derive the NetServe setting from the socket that that NetServe is listening to. And they have a secure keyword for that socket that you could say set to yes and no. And so that will, that will effectively set the, the NetServe setting based on what the socket has. Anyway, it, it affects both uh, sets of connections, inbound and outbound. So I looked at the restart info on here, and I, I had a laugh because this one, here's the uh, JES common piece, and they talk about, okay, shut all this stuff down, and then issue your LLA refresh, and then bring it all back up. But if you want to actually use it in JES 2, you need to IPL with CLPA. So then <laughs> I thought, well, I'm not going to do that. That's too much work. Uh, so I couldn't understand even why they do that, but I guess these groups don't necessarily all talk to each other. But then I saw there was a method to their madness because in the JES 3, they actually have a, a restart on there. So it does make sense. If you happen to be a JES 3 customer putting this on, you could do it without an IPL. So, um, so uh, IBM wanted us to, to give this message. I'm giving it to you now. There's a uh, secure portal. I think uh, Sam's probably going to be talking about that, so I don't want to steal any of his thunder. 
Um, but there is a new white paper out there. And if you uh, don't feel bad if you haven't read it yet, because it was only published August 3rd, right? NJE <laughs> Security Best Practices. So if we didn't know what to do before, uh, that's because nobody told us. And now, uh, now we can read and, and find out what it is we are supposed to be doing or should have been doing for all these nine years. And um, then in, in general, general security uh, best practices, you know, what, what sorts of things should you do? Be careful about who can access your NJE connections through TCP IP. Do Windows computers have access to that? If so, is that coming through an ATTLS type connection? Is there a password on it? You know, what kind of security do you have? They don't really give you hints as to where these, what these um, problems are, but, but you can sort of guess at maybe what uh, some of the issues were, where, where the exposure might be. All right. So uh, lastly, Tom. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Well, I was just in the in the interest of time. Okay. In the interest of time, I was trying to move on. This has been around a long time too. Jez Pool class. That's been around a long, long time since Rack F 1.9. And uh, what he the point that Tom wants me to hammer home, so I will do it because you've asked me to, is that the Jez Pool class protects your data sets on Spool. Okay. So it's very similar to the data set class in. Uh, your standard uh, for your standard files. So if you do not have just spool active, then these uh, spool data sets are not protected. So anyone who can use an unauthorized uh, uh, SSI type service to get out a spool data set without just spool protection would then be able to read that spool data set. So it's important to to uh, have just spool uh, active in your shops. That's because it used to be an authorized service, and some, some uh, very inventive soul decided to make it an unauthorized service some little while ago. 1.9, OK. So, uh, so keep that in mind. That means you have an, an, an exposure. OK, so uh, TPG, I'll try to go quickly through this. But um, basically, there was this APAR here, OA46359, uh, and we started getting these OC4s, and we didn't understand why, or our customers did. And it's because the TPG service inside this module, uh, VT put, was trying to write onto the input parameter list. And it was pretty shocking. So we you know, dumped out the code and looked at it, and you know, R4 was the TCB address. Uh, R1 turns out to be the TCB PKF value, if you know what that is, the protection key that the task is started with. And then you had this move uh, with destination key. They were moving one byte back into the parameter list. And we thought, oh, well, that code's been around a long time. Maybe something, uh, um, I'm sorry, the, the writing to the back to the parameter list was something new. So when we researched it, we found, no, writing back to the parameter list is something the operating system has been doing forever and ever and ever. Probably goes back to the you know, MVT days or whenever it was TSO first came out. This is the parameter list that uh, TPG uses. And there's a little line in there that says, oh, by the way, we set this indicator in the TPG parameter list to let you know that register 0 contains an output buffer number. I didn't even know this was there, to be honest. So uh, what that meant then, since this was really old, is that they changed the way they write to this thing. Which So then I wanted to look it up and find the APAR, but it couldn't be viewed. Well, if you find an APAR that can't be viewed, it means it's an integrity APAR. That is how IBM does it, rightly or wrongly. That is what they do. They don't want the description of the APAR uh, to where anybody could read it, because then they think maybe somebody could exploit it, right? So um, that's usually a, a security APAR, an integrity APAR. I have no knowledge at all as to what actually happened, which is good. Because if I did, then I'd probably un be under NDA, and I couldn't tell you, or they'd have to kill me. But since uh, I don't know that I have the freedom to speculate, now hopefully I can educate a guess and figure out some of this stuff. So anyway, what I'm thinking is they probably were turning that bit on in the input parameter list, maybe in key zero or something like that. And so if somebody invoked TPG and pointed it to funny storage, they could cause bits to get turned on in different places in the system. That might not be good. Uh, <laughs> they might, might be that they could cause, you know, uh, uh, key zero code somewhere to, you know, the, the instruction could change because this bit got turned on. I mean, it's scary, actually, if you think about it. So if, if that's, in fact, what it was, I, I highly understand why they did it. But the way they changed it was they, they wanted to use the TCB PKF key, which didn't work. 
uh, for us because we had authorized privilege code doing TPG. And so we talked to IBM and, uh, you know, said, we think you're in cre creating a new exposure here because now privileged code has to put the TPG parameter list into non-privileged type storage that anybody could write on and they could do it asynchronously and then we might be writing who knows what to a, to a screen. And so the uh, Z System Center for Secure Engineering agreed with us and, and told the IBM TSO guys to uh, m make a change there. So anyway, that's, that's the APAR. And what I was gonna recommend is now, you know, it's either my educated guess or some other thing. I have no idea, honestly, no actual real knowledge about what the problem was. But it may be a good idea, probably is a good idea, to get that APAR installed. And then the fallout from that APAR, possible OC4s and products like ours and others, uh, you may want to then uh, add on this new one that we got opened up to avoid those disruptions. Okay. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ann Matias. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hey, Tom, before you leave, I, I like that. I'm going to do this, and you should do it because Cheryl said so. I'm going to try that on a change record. <laughs> on the change record, it has, why are we making the change? Because Cheryl, Cheryl said so. <laughs> I like that. So um, I spent the last year off and on, kind of, um, not necessarily moving a data center, but picking up the workload, moving it somewhere else, and setting it back down. So what we had is two Z10s at, at the site that I live at, uh, a Z196 and a new EC12 at a third site. So we're doing a little bit of a shell game where site two is moving to site three, and one and two backed each other up. So after we do that, then three has to be converted for the backup for one and for one and it becomes one and three backing those guys up. <laughs> yeah, that's how blondes think. <laughs> um, we have Hitachi VSP DASD at all three sites. It's replicated. Uh, there isn't quite enough for shadow image, um, so that was a challenge for us. Uh, and a 7720 VTL grid, um, which actually was hugely helpful. So there's just a little picture of where we're at before and where we were at after. Um, something I like to advise everybody is to trust your highly paid consultant. So this is the conversation that happened between me and my manager. How long, and this is in a meeting by the way. We're not gonna do this in quiet. We're gonna do this right in the meeting with everybody else around. How long is it gonna take? Six hours. What do you base that on? 25 years of experience, a lot of cutovers, you know. I think it'll be two. Alrighty then. <laughs> <coughs> How long was it, everybody? Six. <laughs> it was a little more than five and a half, but, but pretty dang close. And the point here is, do you want to be a hero and come in under budget, or, or do you want to look like an idiot and come in three hours over? That's your choice. Um, so the timeline planning, once we got another month down the road, did end up being six hours. The outage was 5.5. There wasn't a whole lot to do um, on the night of cutover. Uh, we had some... Um, since we went to the EC12 and we were sharing it with another person, <laughs> there was a lot more DASD than we were used to, so we had to bump up SQA and in load XX. We had some console changes because also sizing issues. We had a lot more OSAs to play with, so we did some changes around there. But basically that night we shut down test and then we shut down prod. Um, we stopped the replication. We brought up a, a one-pack system. You could have done this from the storage navigator, which is the uh, little client that facilitates stuff in Hitachi, but we en ended up running a job just because it's a lot less clicky clicks. Um, HUR is Hitachi Universal Replicator. They were able to do a pair create with copy none <clears throat> because everything had already been um, sent over and then was caught up afterwards. Um, we IPL'd the production LPARs and then we IPL'd the test LPARs. Can anyone tell me why? Okay. Um, in between the network time, uh, the network guys down the hall removed the natting and started. Did you know that you can't just like have a firewall and remove the natting? You now have to start advertising the routes. And you have to wait like 30 minutes till they get all around your country. <laughs> um, we IPL'd production first because it didn't really matter if tests worked, if production didn't work. And everything was back at the other data center. 
So as long as we had production working, we knew that we could somehow or other get test working. So that was, and that was actually to save 15 minutes, right? <laughs> Um, so when we brought it up, um, network was, it was, it was all about the network. Um, I was like a person going to the electric chair. I mean, I was resigned to my fate. It's going to be a long night. The network guys are going to screw up. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's not much I can do about that. I've done everything I can, tried to explain to everyone I can, and now I'm just going to the electric chair to take my medicine. Um, but it actually turned out being okay. We did turn the system over to application, what we call owners. So these are uh, like a big C customer versus a little C customer, and they pretty much know their applications. We d I can't test a web sphere. I don't know what to bring up. I don't even know where the JCL is. They, they do all of that. Um, and then we made a go-no-go -no -go decision before the FDR backups. And the plan was, you know, most of the night then, we would stay there and fight fires. And I would love to have a fire to explain to you. You know, because that's kind of what we do in the Bitbucket is we caution you against this might happen and that might happen. And <laughs> it was really good. It really was. I think we've come a long way. So in hindsight, the question about how long the outage will be um, was a big debate. We, we had a lot of meetings on that. Um, testing plans were something I know everybody, nobody wants to do. But I actually spent a whole lot of time on testing plans. And now I have them. And they're easy rep replicatable. So... Uh, when we put maintenance on 2.1, about six weeks ago, I'm able to run through, I have a whole data set now with all the test jobs, run through all the jobs, put the output in a PDS, compare the outputs, keep the outputs uh, ongoing so that I can say, well, this worked on this date, kind of thing. So I'm a big fan of those now. Um, I also did a lot of, because I don't trust the network people, <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> I did a lot of displays, uh, the NetStat connection display, and kept all that stuff uh, from like the night before, the week before, and then compared it to day of kind of thing. Are you starting to think I'm a little OCD, aren't you? Um. Yeah. <laughs> um, the before and after syslogs were actually a problem too. Um, we have not IPL'd that system yet. We cut over May 30th. Uh, we did IPL a test system, and there were some things that, that happened, and again, you know, it was kind of, it was all new to us, um, but we weren't sure if this is something that normally happens, or is this a problem. Um, so I wish I would have had more, more syslogs for that. Oh, and by the way, in their infinite wisdom, WebExes are blocked from midnight to 6 a.m., because, you know, Lord knows, Russian WebEx has always happened between midnight and 6 a.m., right? I don't know. Um, so we did increase the number of generations for syslog. We also added in some things uh, for a monthly and a yearly syslog to keep. Um, we moved our, our operations, and unfortunately, um, we were two weeks delayed. We were going to go May 15th, and we ended up going May 30th. So by that time, again, in their infinite wisdom, uh, management had gotten rid of all the operators. We won't need them after May 15th. And we kept saying, we're probably not going to make that. We're probably not going to make that. So May 11th, <laughs> we're not going to make that. And they finally accepted that, but the operators were gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we had to do the IPLs. And that's another part of what came in with us, you know, as far as system programmers looking at a normal IPL. And it's going really fast. And you have to look and see, is this normal? Is this not? DCPII failed. Is that normal? Yes, I haven't set it up on that LPAR that kind of thing. Um, so run your batch job with the outputs commands of commands that you want to do. Keep that from before and after. And I use disk to do that. Um, we also now have a better dock for recovering our consoles because I love those network guys. Uh, <laughs> this, this, is, this network is in a more formal site, whereas the other one pretty much we had our own little uh, subnet that we kept things on and it stayed up. So that's not the way, that's not the way things work now. There's another network and it doesn't stay up. It, it bounces, you know, even they say it's, it's not going to be an outage or it's just going to be a blip. Well, if it's a blip, you know, the, the console is going to go. Possibly the HMC is going to reboot uh, if it's a power blip. So we're getting better now. And it's that sad, isn't it, that we've come to the point where we're actually going backwards, we're regressing in that we have to plan for more outages. 
And then we had an issue with um, 30 days of tapes, but it ended up being good for us because the tape guy went through and was able to document all of the durations of his tapes with this grid thing. We weren't sure how long it was going to take for all of our tapes to catch up. Um, and he found out that basically 98% of our tapes are 30 day retention or less. Um, so we figured we were safe after 30 days and that two week delay came in really handy there because uh, we might not have made it. We, we would have had an, to wait another two weeks, but since we were delayed, we got the 30 days in and everything had gotten replicated. And then I just wanted to add a slide about how to get um, TSO disk because I'm such a big fan of it. And it's actually, oh, I can't use the death thing. There's actually several of them out there. Mark Zeldin sent me an email right away and said, well, they, they can use mine. Um, yeah, and Lionel has one and there's another one out here that just kind of captures the output of your command. That way you can page for it, forward and backward in, in a netstat command or, or whatever. And that is the end of that. All right. Everybody uh, had, has probably heard us talk about integrity before. We've talked about it in the bucket. It's the subject in many other sessions. Uh, a couple, you know, Ed and alluded to security integrity APARs. So th this is a theme that's been discussed and shared before. Most of you are familiar with it. But there's, there's also a rule that you, know, you need to hear something seven times before it really sticks with you. So we're going to talk about it again. And the other, the other rule is that the only sure thing is change. And there have been some changes, small but important ones. So most of you are probably familiar with IBM's statement of integrity. And this is a fantastic value attribute of our platform for, for the ZOS operating system. That we, because at the time this was happening, back in the 70s, it was not a guarantee that vendors would fix problems that opened up an integrity hole. So for IBM, you know, with some intense dialogue with customers, to come out and say in writing to commit that they would fix any problem that was reported to them that resulted in integrity exposure was fairly unique. This was not common. So, and this has stood for over three decades. It, it shows IBM's confidence and commitment to the ZOS operating system. And in, in fairness to diversity, some other operating systems like ZVM also have an integrity statement but I'm all about MVS. So we're going to talk about the ZOS statement of integrity. Sam, yep. Four decades. Four decades. Math, not my forte. <laughs> <laughs> so, but something has changed recently. So you can go out and you can, you can look at this. And there's a very long URL. Um, or you could just Google the document name. And you get a nice PDF. And we have talked about this in the bucket before. But, so, but what's changed? I mean, we've covered this before. Why am I bringing it back up? Well, they've revised it, and they now add to the, the statement of integrity that this is for releases that have not reached their announced end of support dates. Now, that wasn't there before, and it might seem obvious that you don't want to run unsupported software, but sometimes you find yourself in a wrestling match with the business because things are not moving very quickly. So adhering to proven practices like not running unsupported software becomes a bone of contention. This is IBM putting a stake in the ground and saying they are going to continue to do this, but only on releases, they're only committed to do it on releases that are in support. And this gives you another consideration to put in front of your management team, in front of planners, in front of the business, when they're looking at, you know, potential action plans going forward, like, oh, well, couldn't we just put that off for another year? And you have to remind them that running unsupported not only is a risk, oh, well, well we're not going to run into any bugs because we're not going to change anything, but also means that you could be exposed to security vulnerabilities which could be used to attack the business that don't require you to make a change because the vulnerability has surfaced outside of your world but could now intrude very rudely into it 
and you have no way to defend against it because you're on an unsupported release and you're not guaranteed to get a patch. So very small but very important change to the statement of integrity. So how can you find out? Well, you obviously can come to share, you can see great presentations from you know, Riaz and other people here, but there is this really nice IBM website and as it happens, ZOS bubbles right to the top. Isn't that great? <laughs> so uh, this is the standard IBM disclaimer, but you can go to this site, you can do searches, and if you just pull it up without putting any, anything into the search box, it just happens that ZOS is gonna be right here and you can see that you know, ZOS 2.1, for instance, and the support has not yet been announced. If you go back to 1.13, end of support is coming up in September 2016. And there are occasionally extensions to support the life cycle and our IBM presenters you know, have detailed these endlessly. Those extensions usually cost additional money, something that people would prefer to avoid. So proven practice, all things considered, Stay current, stay supported, you know, and upgrade appropriately. For that gets you your security integrity patches as well as all the other benefits of new feature and function. So, security portal. Jeff Magdal talked about this on Monday in the MBS project opening. And it's, it's worth revisiting a little bit because there are still people who haven't registered for this. And we've been talking about it off and on for a few years here. Uh, IBM has really stressed the need for every customer to be signed up in the security portal because there, uh, several years ago they made sort of a, a really frantic set of notifications to customers, personal phone calls around the holidays. Some of you may remember that. They've said after you know, really stressing that customers needed to be in here, they're not going to do that again. You know, it probably caused as much trouble as you know, prevented problems. So, the key message is you want to register for the security portal because that is the means by which you as a customer can become aware of integrity APARs and security PTFs. So not only does it tell you what they are, it provides some classification information with this common vulnerability scoring system. So that lets you know how serious it is. So you can at least again make some sort of an educated judgment as to whether you would perhaps go outside your normal deployment cycle in getting this fix onto your systems. Because we all, we hate to deal with exceptions. You know, I'm deploying maintenance quarterly, I'm following RSUs. Do I really want to put these security PTFs on out of cycle? This is going to give you the guidance you need to make an educated decision. So you go there, you give your customer name, uh, your name, your resource link ID, and uh, some people have observed that you really have to have your, your business email tied to your resource link ID or it's very, you know, the, the registration process for the security portal at least will sort of run afoul. So in the last conference, kind of a related topic, we had a, a keynote speaker, Phil Young. At the time he was from Visa, now he's with Wells Fargo. He has for several years been a very loud and uh, thoughtful voice uh, sometimes slightly provocative, around security integrity topics for the platform. And essentially has raised the issue that the mainframe is not protected by a magic bubble or fairy dust. It requires proven security practices, not only by IBM, but by customers. Appropriate configuration, and that in fact things which occur on every other computing platform, like zero-day exploits, where you know hackers Good guy, security researchers, be they white hats or bad guys, black hats, discover a potential exposure of vulnerability that allows them to escalate privilege to, to, and build exploit code for it. These things exist for the mainframe. So zero days exist for the mainframe. You can have exposures for which you do not yet have a fix. And in the best of all possible worlds, they're discovered by customers or, or white hat security researchers. The reported IBM fixes are created before they're ever out in the wild. But there have been cases in the real world, and Phil talked about this in C at Share in Seattle, where you know, adversarial uh, individuals who were attacking a particular enterprise created zero day exploits and used them before they were ever known and before a fix, there, any fix was created or available. They were only 
you know, patched after the fact. Um, so Phil has been busy. Uh, he was not here at Share this week. There's a good chance he's going to be back in San Antonio. He has a, a great blog. I realize that uh, Tumblr may not be accessible from some of your corporate uh, desktops owing to sort of net nanny software, but nonetheless, that's where his blog is, and uh, it's pretty good. He posts a lot of interesting security-related notes there, things that he's doing, things that other people are doing. And this is a growing community, and it's a community that's growing not in the way that it used to grow, where it was very closed and things were only discussed in private and back hallways and private meetings, but in the same culture that is going on in open systems and the, the, really the rest of enterprise computing, which is things are discussed out in the open, they may be reported to a vendor, but if the vendor doesn't respond in a timely fashion, researchers feel no hesitation about doing full disclosure to the world globally through the internet, through mailing lists, and they generally create proof of concept exploit code to prove that what they're asserting is true. So, Phil and uh, one of his par uh, a fellow researcher were speaking at DEF CON in Las Vegas this week. Go figure. He wanted to be in Las Vegas talking at a security conference with a bunch of hackers, you know, as opposed to hanging out at Share in Florida. I can't imagine why he did that. But really cool thing about DEF CON, and there is some good material here, not just related to mainframes, but in security research in general. They take all of their proceedings, almost all of it's videoed. They put it all out for free, no authentication, defcon.org. The videos actually go out on media.defcon.org. So you'll be able to see his talk. The slides are already posted in a couple of places. The tools that he and the, uh, the fellow hacker, and, and his sort of hacker uh, name is Soldier Fortran. His, uh, his partner's uh, name who's been working with him on this research is Big Endian Smalls. And uh, they created some new uh, exploits in shellcode, some new tools, and they've released them on GitHub, which is a very popular open source platform for sharing code. And you think, well, what could they have created? So Nmap is a, a, a common open source tool. It's been around for decades. I won't say how many. Math not being my forte again. But they created enhancements to that to identify typical mainframe services like 3270. Phil runs scans for mainframes that are sitting out on the internet. And these are the, this is a common tool used by penetration testers. People, uh, Mark Wilson is a, speaks here at SHARE, is a, does penetration testing on mainframe. People who, at the request of an enterprise, try to breach a system to verify that the controls and defenses are appropriately secure. Uh, they created some NJE exploits. So, what Ed talked about with the new security, you know, PTFs for Jez probably would be timely to make sure that those are applied to your system, given that tools to reveal some of these problems might already be in existence out in the public and available to the team that might come in to test your mainframe or to adversaries who might actually wish to gain entry to your enterprise illicitly. They created a... Uh, TN3270 server that could be used as a honeypot for people who thought they were logging on to an actual system or to affect a man in the middle attack where they, you could create code that someone thought they were logging on to their corporate TN3270. It was just capturing their credentials and then passing them on and logging them on to their real server. We can no longer rely on security by obscurity or the myth that the mainframe is protected by a magic bubble. In some ways, they're saying things that are true. I mean, the, the, they're saying the emperor has no clothes. We have the most robust, securable platform available, but if we don't choose to follow good practices as far as security patches and configuration, we are naked and they are completely justified in pointing to us and saying that, you know, we, have, you know, we, we, we don't have this magical suit of armor. We have to do our part. So the talks from his last, uh, slides from his last talk are out on SlideShare. Uh, there was a very thoughtful blog by Mike Rogers from Attachmate that talks about sort of this current state of the security community, black hats, white hats, links to a number of these resources, highly recommend it. And these, the links will be in the slides when they go up or you could find these with Google pretty easily. But, Things are happening, and I advise you to stay tuned to this space.
So he has created a new mailing list uh, for mainframe penetration, mainframe penetration testing. And if you're interested in that topic, whether it's your particular wheelhouse at work or you know people who are, you can uh, zone in on it. Uh, ironically, you get a, a security warning for most modern browsers because there's a little certificate problem on that site. So uh, you, you have to override the safety and security controls in order to subscribe to the list. And I've already given Phil just a, a little bit of a ribbing about this, but it is, it is something that you may want to follow probably a good place to stay in tune with the latest updates to these kinds of tools and developments so you as a defender at least are positioned to protect your enterprise. And now I'm going to hand it over to Skip Robinson who's going to take us home and get us on to San Antonio. Okay, uh, since we're almost out of time, I'm going to kind of just blow through this uh, first pitch which has to do with uh, setting up and using auto IPL in the case of system failures. There are just a few slides there is some question I'll have to tell you about whether or not you need BCPII for this. I spent quite a bit of time with Steve Warren trying to determine is this or is this not a BCPII dependency. I decided in the end that it's probably not because of the way this worked. But basically, if a system stalls and it won't respond to uh, the other systems in a sysplex after a certain length of time specified in your sysplex failure management policy, then it will be fenced out of the plex by somebody else. If you specify a standalone dump, that dump will be taken with, uh, and if you set your standalone dump up right, it will not even be prompted. The operator will not even see the prompt. It will happen, and as soon as the dump is finished, the system will be IPL'd again. We had some episodes of this in the beginning of R12 where it would just happen at random times of day or night, and we could not figure out what was going on at first. Uh, this one that happened a few weeks ago happened during shutdown, so operators were watching. From their perspective, they issued a system shutdown, and there were a bunch of messages going back and forth and some complaints about this system. The next thing they knew, the system was coming up and they had no idea why. We had to explain this whole process. But I'm gonna move on to, to a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, it has to do with an emulator. Is Rosalind still here? She had to jump out. Okay, so at the beginning of the week, Rosalind was talking about alternatives to TN3270 emulators. Uh, using uh, DevOps and other kinds of products. And it seems to be the question from, from the, the whippersnappers, why do they need a green screen anyway? What's it good for? Well, uh, 100 years ago, people depended on horses for daily transportation. Nobody that I know of anywhere in, in, in the modern world does that anymore. But when you go down and you spend $75,000 for a Tesla, it's going to be measured in horsepower at some point. So. So these things don't just disappear because uh, we, th we think they're old fashioned. Okay, this is a particular product. Uh, we don't like to talk about products specifically. Well, okay, this is not an ISV presentation. I have no connection with this product other than being a devoted user of it for a long, long time. I used to work with the author of this, Tom Brennan. He's not a colleague anymore. For years, he, he forbid me from talking about it at Share. And uh, we don't work together anymore, so tough luck. <laughs> Sometime back in the 90s when I came to, uh, to SCE, uh, he and I worked together. We were sysprogs. And he came in to me one day and said, would you like to try out this emulator that I wrote? From that day forward, I have never used another emulator at work. And this was basically beta, but it was so good that I stuck with it. And if there was a problem with it, he would say, well, why don't you go use uh, something else? Instead, he would fix it for me, and there was never any reason to, to use anything else. It's the only emulator, okay, and I'm, I'm stating this because I believe it to be true, the only emulator that's written by an experienced mainframe sysprog. That is, this emulator was not written by somebody who knew how to write emulators, and oh, by the way, what do you guys need? He was a professional sysprog who wrote an emulator that would serve his purposes, my purposes, your purposes. He learned MVS first for many years, then he learned C++ and Windows application programming and whatever it takes to make these things work. I don't even know the internals. But he, he knew what we need from the beginning. What does an emulator, what's it used for? What will help us in our work? What will uh, make things go faster, easier? And, um, and that's what he wrote. It contains time and labor-saving usability features. 
uh, variations of copy-paste. Okay, this is sort of standard copy-paste, but he's got other kinds of things built in to, to make copy-paste more efficient in a TN3270 world. Uh, macros, I'll give an example of a macro. Very easy to create and record. Uh, some of these uh, features are supported by shortcut keys, uh, the ones that you use the most, I would guess. Uh, and others, uh, there's easy drop-down menus for selecting some of these other options. And what's key here is that many of these functions are context sensitive for JCL. I mean, that's what we, most of us deal with on, on, a, on a regular basis, which says that I know what a JCL thing looks like, and I'm going to assist you in manipulating your JCL. It can also work for other kinds of things with keyword equals value, but it's mainly oriented toward JCL. It's easy to install and to configure. It's lightweight, it initializes very quickly, and it installs in its own directory structure. What the, one thing this means is when you move from one release to another, it maintains all of your old settings. However you had it configured before, in the new uh, release, it's going to look the same. Now, there are some downsides, which need to be stated up front. It works for Windows only, and that's a, a showstopper for some people who want Linux, but no, there's no Linux version. It no does, version sorry? I don't even understand that. Oh, Mac. I'm sorry, Mac. Mac, 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 Mac. I thought you said something else. Okay, you're right. Sorry. No Mac. Uh, yes, it's only, it's only Windows. Uh, it doesn't do certain kinds of, I just say fancy graphics, um, things that uh, traditional 3270 is capable of if you have all the right stuff. Um, I personally have never missed those. And main, Tom's main reason for not ever trying to put that in was, it's a dumb place to do fancy graphics anyway. If you want fancy graphics, go to something, you know, web pages or whatever. And the other thing is that Tom Brennan is a one-man ISV. I mean, it's just him. There's nobody else. Uh, could be an issue in a large shop. Uh, however, I can firmly say, as a user of this for, for many, many years, that there is no ISV on Earth that has provided better service than Tom okay, himself. That you report a problem to him, and you may get a, a fix to try out even the next day. I've used Vista for all my mainframe work, and I've had no pushback from my management. It is not the official emulator at the company. Uh, I would love it to be, but uh, it's one of these okay, other, other issues. And this is not a fiscal problem. That's all I'm going to say about money. Uh, it's it's an, a, corporate, a corporate policy issue as to whether or not your company might give you static for using this product. OK, this is, uh, it's got a customizable toolbar at the top. Uh, all these, each of these icons means something. You can choose which ones to show and which ones not to show. Uh, that's, that's your choice. And when you set it up, it will stay how, whoever you set it from, from release to release. It has um, file drop-down menus. This is in the case under, under file. You see some of the options that are there. I'm not going to go into them, but, but you get those options. OK, under edit, which is where, where a lot of the power is. Uh, so edit, copy functions. OK, copy append, append no CR, copy fields, copy truncate. I'm not going to talk about which ones these are, uh, which what they do. But if you try out the product, explore them. Paste functions are especially interesting. Uh, it's not just normally, just not no ordinary you know, paste the thing you got. But it pastes into the text that you're typing into based on the kind of text that it appears to be. So we get paste JCL, overlay, insert, yaka waka. Uh, some of these actually Tom wrote for me back in the days when IBM Main used to be a VM system. And you would get this blank screen that you had to put text into, paste text into uh, whatever your problem description. And it came out looking weird. And I'd say, Tom, you know, this really looks bizarre. And a few days later, he said, well, try this. And it would be a formatted version of whatever text I copied from into a window that I drew on my screen. It was really cool. It still works. I just don't have the, the need for it the way I used to. Um, I'm going to give an example later on of a, of a, a paste repeat. Um, and there's also a paste continue, by the way, which if you need to copy this much text into uh, a member that you've only got this big a screen, you can copy fill the screen. Scroll, copy, continue. He remembers where you left off. He'll keep co copying as many times as you iterate until finally all of the data is copied into this one single member or data set. It's really kind of cool. 
and select functions, okay? How you select the stuff that you're going to, to copy, uh, different, different options, and I'll give some examples. Um, well, shoot, I'm out of time. I, I really want to give a demo. If you're interested in seeing what it looks like, I'm going to log on to my system at home and show how some of this stuff works. Macro is really, is really useful. There's some options. Okay, this is a macro, an example of logging on to my system. When you hit my system well, before you've connected with, with, uh, with, with Vista, you get just a blank screen. That's all there is. Then you have to type in something to get a network response back. Uh, well, actually, first, like, first I guess you get a, a thing that says, if you don't belong here, get the hell out, or whatever it actually says. Uh, and then you type in, in my case, TPX something something, and then I would type in a user ID, and then finally you get the TPX menu, which you'll see. So this is what the macro looks like. I did not code this. I just turned the macro recording on, went through the sequence to log on, and then said, I'm done, and this is the macro that it created. Um, so the, the key part is uh, the TPX PC mod 4, and then finally at some point he goes and looks to see if the system has come back to him. He types in my user ID and then uh, a new line which finishes the screen. I do not put my password in here. I wouldn't recommend anybody doing it, but there's nothing to prevent it, okay? If, if you're that um, adventurous, it's just stored in a text file somewhere. Um, probably not a good idea. So after issuing that macro, this is what I see. It's, it's built the whole screen. I've not had to, to type in that extra stuff. Okay, now I'm gonna give this example. This is where, if I hope I can get it to work. If you have to leave, sorry. But this has some really cool stuff where you, which I call editing within the product. Okay, this is a, this is a little play for, uh, for PDS tools or star tool as well. So I have, a, I have a JCL data set. This is what it looks like to start with. I happen to prefer to have the disposition first or whatever and the data set last because I like to see it at the end. So I could retype this stuff. I could move things around, do inserts. But with Vista, what I can do is, is start here. I'm, I'm, I'm just right-clicking now. I'm right-clicking on data set name. And notice how it picks up DSN equals the whole thing. Sorry? OK, session's over. Sorry, guys. Um, but but uh, what, cause what I wanted to show was that you click on something like a data set name, and it's, it highlights the data set name DSN equals plus the whole data set name that follows it. And when you highlight it, then you can manipulate it as a single unit. You don't have to, you can, but you don't have to draw your, your uh, cursor along the, the, the statement as long as it's a single JCL parameter. Now, if you want to pick up multiples, yeah, then you would need to start at the beginning, drag it across to pick up the whole thing. But individual uh, keyword equals uh, uh, syntax will be selected automatically on a right click. And then you can manipulate that, copy, uh, paste, into, over, whatever. Uh, really lots of cool things. Um, anyway, it says, basically, see you in San Antonio. Thank you very much for coming to share this week. I hope you had a good time. The next one is uh, Remember the Alamo, and uh, we'll see you in about six months. Thank you very much.